Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come to Tijuana and, and talk about my research. I'm sorry my Spanish is very, very rusty, but if I could stay for two weeks, it would be, it would be a lot better. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today, my research looks very much at bariatric surgery from the patient perspective. So I'd like to talk to you a bit about today is to give you a greater understanding of the social aspects of bariatric surgery and to highlight the main social aspects that patients see following surgery to present a conceptual theory of risk adjustment to the social aspects of bariatric surgery and to apply this theory in the context of patients that undergo revisional procedures. So currently we know that bariatric surgery profoundly affects the social aspects of a patient's life. So life is very, very different after surgery for them. But these social aspects are not really widely researched and they're not really widely understood. The adjustments are often influenced by previous weight-related stigma prior to surgery, and there's high rates of partial and non-disclosure around scrutiny of a changed appearance and eating habits after surgery. So a lot of times patients don't want anyone to know how they've lost the weight. That's a very important thing, so the non-disclosure is something that, that's quite important to them. So as I said before, many patients have experienced weight-related stigma prior to surgery, but that feeling of failure remains. Society, the mechanisms of bariatric surgery are not widely understood. So we here in this room understand how bariatric sur surgery works. We're very familiar with the mechanisms of surgery, but the wider society doesn't know that information. There's a perception of the procedures doing the work as opposed to the patients. So a lot of times the patients are labeled as cheats or surgery is perceived as, as taking the easy way out, whereas there's just no redemption in surgery, but there is redemption in diet and exercise because that is perceived to have patient involvement as, as a mechanism of weight loss, and surgery doesn't for some reason. Yeah, sorry. So the impact of that judgment around bariatric surgery is patients being afraid or reluctant to disclose the reason for their changed appearance or their eating habits and engaging in social activities, which, you know, for us in the room is something that's a very pleasant experience. For these people, it's a very, very uncomfortable situation, especially eating out in restaurants we've identified with a group of patients. That is, that is quite painful and really, really difficult for, for bariatric patients. If we look at typical social situations, we've got patients, we've got personal relationships, we've got the wider family relationships, we have work relationships, and we have external, wider relationships. Some of these are permanent, and some of these are transient, but relationships evolve and they build through social encounters. If you look at social penetration theory, which was a theory developed by Altman and Taylor in 1973, they, they, they posit that relationships begin and deepen through self-disclosure. So we have a wide breadth of relationships, so looking at work, family, communities, people with similar interests, and we look at the depth of those relationships and, and the layers in which people go through in terms of the um, intimacy. So Alton Taylor suggested that there's five layers of intimacy that people progress through. These stages, they can switch, people can move between these stages, so they're not linear. And I think it's really important to try and understand this in the context of bariatric patients following surgery. So if you, if you, sort of, if you can think of an, an onion, and think of the way you would peel the layers of an onion. It's a really good way of, of conceptualizing this theory. So we have the outer layer of the onion. So that's the orientation layer. This is where relationships are quite superficial. Um, so as we, we sort of move into the, what we call the exploratory effective layer, this is, this, is sort of, this is a little more personal, but still it's very casual. And the majority of encounters sort of between friends and work colleagues are, are at this level. When we go deeper into the effective layer, more personal information is revealed at this stage, so the person would be quite comfortable moving on to these stages, and they generally wouldn't progress through the, to the deeper layers unless they were comfortable with the person. So the stable layer, so this, this person would be comfortable disclosing deeply personal information. So perhaps this is somebody in a long-term relationship, you know, just family members, marriages. So you're very comfortable revealing personal information at this stage. However, in the middle, we have what we call the depenetration layer. And this is where the cost of self-disclosure outweighs the benefits of disclosing. So the person would actually withdraw 
from any form of social interaction. So say we would progress through, but you can move back and forth between these layers. So the application to bariatric patients, the fear of judgment and the reluctant, reluctant, reluctance to disclose means a lot of patients feel very comfortable in that orientation, that superficial layer. Because if you stay in that superficial layer, that means you don't really have to reveal anything. You can just keep it very casual, very, very top line. However, if we go back to a scrutiny of a very rapidly changing appearance, changed eating habits mean people often feel pressured into entering the deeper layers. So they're not quite ready or they're not sure if they're going to be judged. So they want to stick with that super level. But often in social encounters, some of the questions they'll be asked will be questions they would ask it in a more, you know, sort of stable or deeper relationship. So they feel quite vulnerable. They're not comfortable there. But they conceptualize that as risky because they really don't know what the outcome of that social encounter is, is going to be. So if we frame social risk in bariatric patients, a lot of the social encounters are underpinned by risk, and a lot of that risk, they don't know what is going to happen. So if they're asked, well, why, why have you lost all this weight? If they say I've had bariatric surgery, are they going to be judged? And then if you think they've suffered with the stigma, and now they're swapping the stigma for the judgment, they're not going to be very, very keen on revealing the information. But it's the meaning of that interpretation of the social risk that would dictate what actions they take, whether they disclosed, whether they were comfortable taking the conversation further. And I think we as healthcare professionals really need to understand the perceptions of these social risks so we can support patients pre- and post-operatively, enhance the patient experience, and improve quality of life for patients. If we look at a study we carried out um, over three years at, between the University of Sunderland and Sun Royal Hospital, we used a qualitative methodology. So here, we're not after large numbers. We wanted to understand and provide a theoretical explanation of patient experiences. Qualitative research typically has very small sample sizes, but the aim of that is to gain really in-depth narrative information from the patients. And we take an inductive approach, so we're not, we don't have a hypothesis. We don't know, and we're quite comfortable knowing what we don't know. But the reason for taking that approach is we want to keep an open mind, and we really want to find out what's going on in the minds and the hearts of these patients. So we had 18 participants that took place in this study. We had 11 females and 7 males, so we were quite happy that we were able to get male representation so, so highly, because typically it's very, very difficult to recruit males into sort of research around social aspects of surgery. They were all interviewed between five and 24 months after surgery. 16 had primary procedures and two had revisional procedures, but I would say at the time that that was about, that was about right. We weren't carrying out many revisional procedures. So if we looked at findings, we came up with what we called the risk adjustment theory. And that was that the patients took actions on social situations based on their perceptions of risk. The, risk, the research identified three categories of risk adjustments in the way that, that people coped after surgery. We had risk acceptors, risk challengers, and risk contenders. The risk acceptors, who were the sort of highest, so we had 12 out of the 18, they were comfortable in most situations. They were very, very good at identifying and practically thinking about what situations could be difficult and what they might do about it. So there was a lot of preparation, a lot of thinking, a lot of reflecting about these things. They were very, sorry, they were very compliant with pre and so surgical advice. So typically they're patients that you love, they do what you tell them to do and they, and they listen to you. And interesting enough, they all tended to have social support. So they had people they could speak to about the surgery, people they were very comfortable opening up to about some of the problems that they had. This could be family, friends, or co-workers, but there was very different support systems, and it was very much down to the individual. The risk challenger, this, this actually was, we only had one. Um, I'm convinced we probably had, we probably had more, so as, as the research continues, I'm, I'm still looking out for more. This particular patient understood the need for changes after surgery, but he didn't adhere to the advice. He was well aware of the advice, why the advice wasn't given, so it wasn't that he misinterpreted it. He just blatantly wasn't going to do it. Um, he turned up at the interview holding a bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, he smelled of cigarettes, so he'd had a cigarette before the interview, and on the way out, he lit a cigarette afterwards. He continued to smoke. He, he 
openly confessed he, he had sugary drinks. And when we talked about the procedure, so again, there was sort of, he could have had really any of the procedures, there was nothing anatomically wrong about this, but he said, I chose a sleeve gastrectomy because he said, I wanted a normal life. And he said, right, okay. And, um, and he said, I don't want to be constrained by surgery, so the surgery is not going to dictate how I'm going to live my life. I will live my life, and the surgery and the procedure will have to fit in, which I didn't have anybody else just so blatantly, just, it, it was a real challenging, a real affront. Um, but he justified his approach as he had lost weight. He'd lost a considerable amount of weight. He was quite happy to disclose he had surgery. He wasn't bothered about it. But this particular patient was just so completely different from everybody else we interviewed. And when we discussed the findings with the surgeons and with other bariatric units in the country, everybody's seen this patient. But just for some reason, I, I only saw one of them. The last group we had were the risk contenders. These were, I think, perhaps out of all the categories, I think these are the ones I think that we have to be the most concerned about. And I think in terms of future research, this is the group where we need to do the most work with. The adjustment to life after surgery was very complex and it was more difficult. They reported experiencing two different types of setbacks. So there was ones within their control. So typically that was they ate the wrong foods, they gained a bit of weight um, or out of their control. So there was external factors. And there was a case of a patient who had... Um, he had an industrial injury at work, and one of his legs was paralyzed. And he had, some, he had irritable bowel, so we, were very, we, were sort of, we could only do the, the, the sleeve with him. But what he, he needed to lose weight, and he needed to get his weight down to the point where he could have surgery on his back to fix the paralysis on his leg, and then everything, ideally, would be great. But he got within 10 kilos of, his, of the weight needed for surgery, and they wouldn't operate on because he was still deemed a surgical risk because of his weight for the back surgery. So it was very, so these were factors out of his control and it was very much, he reported feeling trapped in that situation, but the, the, the procedure had done the work, he had lost weight, but for this person, that journey hadn't been resolved yet, it was still ongoing. Pre-surgical issues not resolved after surgery was something else they reported. So that is typically, we had a few patients where they were long-term type two diabetics, they were insulin dependent, and what they wanted to do is stop the injections. So, you know, they'd lost the weight, but, you know, they, they were told they, they needed to be on, on insulin for life. So, again, that was an incomplete journey. Um, it wasn't, you know, mismanaged expectations. It was something they wanted. It was something they were told before surgery might not happen. But, um, and again, it didn't happen after surgery. So, again, an incomplete, an incomplete journey. So this group also had rates of high, very high rates of non-disclosure, and that was with immediate family and immediate friends, and this was having experienced judgment and negative comments about weight loss. And there was one woman who revealed, well, it was her best friend who sort of noticed the, the change in the appearance and said, if I find out you've had surgery, I'll never speak to you again. And I think, well, that's a judgment call on bariatric surgery, but you know, what, what sort of person would, would say that to, to somebody else? So considerations for patients undergoing revisional procedures. I think the application of the risk adjustment theory to patients undergoing revisional surgery. The two patients we looked at at the original study had undergone revisional procedures, so they fell into the risk contender category. And the patient journeys were considered to be interrupted or incomplete. And I think that resonates when we bring the patient back for a second procedure. And again, there was very much this, this feeling of failure, and I know we'll talk about that this afternoon, whether it's the patient that fails or the procedure that fails. So again, as the number of revisional procedures are increasing within our unit, we're actually looking at the risk categories, and we're looking at them in the context of, the, um, of, of people who undergo revisional procedures. But I do acknowledge more research is needed in this area as more revisional procedures are carried out. So in summary, societal judgments of bariatric patients are often rooted in the misconceptions of the mechanisms of surgery. <laughs> Social adjustments for our patients are very complex and they're very subjective. I think the risk adjustment theory provides a conceptual framework for us to sort of try and understand the patient experiences and discussions about social adjustments are needed pre and post-operatively and to be part of routine patient support. So thank you very much.